Okay, well, good morning. Welcome everyone to the GWJDD Dermatology Translational Science Lecture Series. Uh, I'd first like to thank our sponsors, uh, for whom there are many. If I can actually advance the slide, that'd be fun. There we go. Um, and you know, I think that's probably hopefully speaks something about our, our speaker who will be introduced in a moment. Uh, but thank you, everyone. I also like to give a shout out to Kroger Pharmacy for sponsoring the breakfast. Um, and just one thing, you know, when I was making the slide, uh, getting all the images for the different uh, companies, uh, you know, when I Googled a main, this is the first thing that came up. Uh, so I, I think there may be some like, trademark infringement. I don't, I don't know. I don't want to get in the middle of that. Um, but uh, at this point, I'd like to actually welcome up first uh, Dr. Scott Norton, a professor of dermatology and chief of pediatric dermatology at Children's National, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. It's a pleasure to be here once again for the Translational Science Grand Rounds. And today, I'm especially pleased to introduce Dr. <coughs> Jocelyn Kirby, who comes to us from Prussia, Pennsylvania, where she is the Residency Program Director at the Pen Pennsylvania State University Milton S. Hershey uh, School of Medicine and uh, Medical Institution. Um, so besides being a program director, she's a real thoughtful individual coming out of her background from Virginia Tech, undergrad, University of Virginia, for medical school, Penn for her residency. But uh, ever since she's uh, been a resident, she has pondered some of these sort of uh, second nature or secondary questions about the diseases that we see so much. So not just what causes it, how do we treat it, but the real value of identifying these diseases and treating them. So I look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. So the first part of the talk is just to say what my goal is from the start. So my hope is that you, number one, not fall asleep. Number two, my hope is I've tried to craft this talk to include things that are very practical, things that we think about every day because I hope that you can leave, and I might even ask you at the end, what are two things that you will maybe change the way you think about? A test that you might order, or how you order tests. Treatments and how you use them, or how you counsel your patients about them. So hopefully some things that are pretty practical. I also have a few disclosures at the bottom of the slide here. They probably won't play much, much of a role. It really pertains to some of the work that I do related to Hidalgo <coughs> superativa. The talk today is really more globally about value and how we bring that to our practice. But one more disclosure I have is <coughs> that I can't work the advancer. <laughs> <laughs> this other disclosure is that it is in my nature to be a bit thrifty. Um, this is my mom. This is us on vacation. It's my older daughter on the right hand side. Uh, my mom raised me and we went through the recession in the 1990s. My dad lost his job and I learned a lot how to think about what something cost but also what it was worth to me. And I got very good at doing that in my personal life. And then as I was starting to practice, I, I was thinking, why am I? Why am I not doing this in my professional life as well? And that's really where a lot of my interest comes from. And it's becoming more and more an interest of our patients. So this is Barbara. This statistic really applies to her because she declared bankruptcy due to the extent of her medical bills. Now, her medical bills were due to her chronic back pain and declaring bankruptcy is certainly the most extreme sense of a financial financial stressor. But you could argue, you know, we're dermatologists. I don't order the tests that are needed for back pain. I don't treat back pain. I didn't contribute to this. But the point is, Barbara might be one of our patients who has back pain, but also has something we do manage. And therefore, the additional things that we prescribe for her or ask her to do add to the stress she already has from medical bills and conditions for other things. Or to Dr. Norton's point about hidradenitis, a chronic condition where people are often um, hospitalized, given IV antibiotics, go through large expensive surgeries. That 
I could imagine could put people in a very tight financial place, and that is in our wheelhouse. So thinking about how what we do really impacts patients. And another point is because I think we always, or at least I do, sometimes try and find what's wrong with an argument first before I see the value in it. You could say, well, people have insurance. You know, a lot of people do. The challenge is that when people have insurance, they increasingly have high deductible insurance. And so I don't know if you're getting a lot of calls right now with it being December. A lot of people have met their deductible. They are going to do everything they can to manage their health right now. Next month is going to be very different. And the decisions that people make might be very different because of the cost of health care. So I want to talk about a couple things. One is what is value? Second one is how might this apply to our everyday practice? And we're going to try and talk about some things that are really common, onychomycosis, acne, biologics things that are related to drug costs and how we prescribe them, especially related to topical steroids, acne, and something called a clawback, which I think is kind of an interesting term, and I'll de define that for you later. So with value, what is value? If I put two things in front of you, two cars, two apartments, how do you compare them? What does value mean in those situations? And I, I mentioned those things because I think thinking about healthcare almost makes it, it's a little bit harder, it's nuanced, it has value and it's a little bit scary sometimes. But if we take it to everyday things, what do you think about when you're thinking about which car do I buy, which apartment do I buy, and maybe that applies to which treatments? What do you guys think? That is an advanced <laughs> statement. Thank you. <laughs> Impressive. He's an economist back there. What was his answer? So he answered, <laughs> I know I'm going to spend some money on a car. What is the increased improvement I might get from the more expensive one, and is it worth it? So if I'm going to buy a car and it's $30,000 and it's the base model, I could buy this other car that's $35,000. What do I get for that $5,000? And is it worth it? But the same thing applies to treatments. If I'm going to manage a patient, I have some amount of money or resource that I might put into something. And is that additional improvement worth it? But is it always a, a cost when you think about things we do for patients in healthcare? What else, what else could be what we're managing? So you want to know how well it works. What if, side effects? Yes. So we could have an amazing treatment that works for everyone, but if it gives every single person intolerable side effects, that is not a valuable treatment anymore, right? So the value equation is what is the benefit I'm going to get over the cost? But that doesn't have to be a literal cost. And the outcome doesn't just have to be that I live longer, because we know for a lot of our diseases, people don't die of acne, but it's an impact on quality of life. How much improvement am I getting in disease control or what the patient experiences, or it could be survival, and cost is not just dollars, but perhaps toxic effects or how well people tolerate it. So I like to use examples of patients because it helps ground me a little bit. So this is Jackie. And she came into clinic, and the first thing I think when I see her is, you have a vitamin I deficiency, isotretinoin. <laughs> I'm going to change your life. Um, and that's what I love about dermatology. Um, when I first started practicing in residency, <clears throat> I, I was a good resident. I got the labs every month. I got back a lot of normal labs every month. And sometimes I would get mildly abnormal labs when I was checking people, but it wasn't changing anything I was doing about my practice. And then I, I finished residency. I was on the remedial track. It took a little while. But I noticed that when I entered my first job, they were not checking labs every month. And I was wondering who was right. Was it right to do it every month? Is it right to not do it every month? I noticed that my patients really like not having to get stuck by a needle every month, so that's a benefit. That's lowering the cost or the impact of the treatment. And so one of the very first projects that I did really just came out of being in clinic and noticing variation. And so I think one of the points I really want to reinforce here is where there is variation in practice, 
there's an opportunity. There's a question to be asked and a answer to be found in who's right, what opportunity do I have to maybe change my practice. And so looking at isotretinoin, the take home point is we can keep people safe, we can give them higher satisfaction, and we can do fewer lab than most people. Because for a lot of these people, uh, the practice is we start at a starter dose, so 30 milligrams or 40 milligrams of isotretinoin for that first month. And then we increase to a maintenance dose of about 60 or 80 milligrams a day, similar to one of the patients we talked about earlier. And it's during that ramp up phase that we see those mild LFT abnormalities, we see the lipid changes, but it's pretty uncommon, this idea of late bloomers. People who go through the beginning just fine, but then suddenly have an abnormality late in the course. That's incredibly rare. So it helps inform how we might choose to do treatment. Skipping the CBC. CBC abnormalities are incredibly rare with isotretinoin. So why was I spending three years checking them? Also, lipid changes are expected. So seeing small increases in the lipids is a normal part of being on isotretinoin, but isn't necessarily going to damage or hurt that patient. So just knowing that they're gonna happen, I think is valuable. And all of this is really important because it's not just the cost of the medication, but for somebody like Jackie, when I first started talking to her, I was so excited to give her the isotretinoin until I saw her reaction to saying, you're gonna need some blood work. And she just like started vibrating in her chair. She was just so afraid of having her blood drawn. And this is very common in that exact group of people that needs isotretinoin. So young adults have the highest rates of fear of needles and even true phobias, where it's like they just run out of the room as soon as you talk about needles. And so if we can decrease the barriers for these people to get to the treatment, it's very different when you talk to somebody and you can say, I think you're gonna need blood work twice. Can you get through it with me twice? Once at the baseline and once in a couple of months and if everything looks good and you're feeling good, we don't have to do it again. And I think this is the best treatment for you. And I think that that is really helpful. So after we looked back at the literature, we then went and looked at our own data and our own practice. And what we noted was that our results really mirrored the literature that very few people have changes outside of the first 60 days. So 66%, two thirds of the abnormalities were found were in those first 60 days and lipid <laughs> abnormalities are the most common abnormalities and they're usually not very severe. So this is our approach for most healthy young people. Now approaches are tailored. They have a rationale. This rationale is based on the data of how the drug performs in most people. I had a young woman who had a history of a hematologic malignancy. And for that reason, we did check a CBC, but there was a rationale to it that maybe for her, this was an important piece to make me comfortable, to make her comfortable, to make her mom comfortable. But CBCs for every person aren't really adding a lot because the changes are so uncommon. <coughs> So we do testing at baseline before they start. At the end of their first month of maintenance, so that's usually day 60 to 61. And what's important is this can save up to $131 million. Sometimes when I talk of the levels of populations, that doesn't help people. But that's $800 to any family who is going through a course of isotretinoin. I used to be able to say that was the cost of an iPhone. Now iPhones are more expensive, but it's still the cost of a phone, essentially, uh, to that person. So it's quite meaningful. I used to order the triglycerides and think I was doing it because it would help me prevent pancreatitis. I would see these triglycerides go up, you know, creep up towards 500, and that would be the time to say, okay, we gotta cool it, I need to save you from pancreatitis. Well, number one, pancreatitis is incredibly uncommon with isotretinoin. This is a review of the literature. They found 24 cases. Now, not everyone's gonna report pancreatitis, but for the cases that were reported, 25% were in the setting of high triglycerides. Flipping that around, that means 75% of the reported cases, people had normal triglycerides. So if my thought was that I was checking <laughs> triglycerides to try and prevent pancreatitis, that's not going to be the case actually for a lot of people that perhaps isotretinoin has an idiosyncratic, not triglyceride mediated pancreatitis risk. So just know that even though you might be watching those triglycerides, which I think is reasonable, it's not always gonna prevent the outcome that we think. 
And I think that this is another point. I spent a lot of months checking potassiums that were mostly normal and a few that weren't, but then when I rechecked them, they were normal. So for a lot of the women who are taking isotretinoin, which is a really valuable medication, those young, healthy women have a lot of normal potassiums. So why am I checking them if less than one half of 1% of women will have an abnormal result? So this is a study that I think was really helpful and really well done, where they looked at how many people had elevated potassiums in their medical system. This is up in Massachusetts. They found 1,800 people who had been given spironolactone for acne. Of those 1,800 young, healthy women, 13 had an abnormal potassium, 13. So that's less than 1%. But as we know, sometimes if a tooth gets shaken around or it sits around a little while, that potassium isn't actually what's happening inside the patient. So six of those people had a recheck of their potassium. It was actually normal. So that leaves seven people where they didn't get rechecked, so we're going to assume that it was a true abnormality. But remember that this is mild, and their definition of mild was above five, which is the upper limit of normal, but less than 5.5. So these are people that are somewhere between five and 5.5, and that is not a physiologically dangerous amount of potassium. So these are people actually went through the course just fine. And what I think was also really interesting is when they looked for all the people who were getting spironolactone and being monitored, they found that already a quarter to a half of the women were not getting potassium. So this practice of knowing that people were fine and the results that we would get by monitoring were not going to change our practice. People were already not monitoring for spironolactone. So I wonder how many of you guys have made changes to how you monitor for drugs? Do you check potassiums every month? Do you check isotretinoin labs every month? I see some head shaking. Is it for both isotretinoin and spironolactone or more for one than the other? I think in the uh, Georgetown Hospital Center uh, system, um, the checking labs for both has dropped tremendously over the last three or four years where the Accutane isotretinoin labs are, as you say, uh, baseline, then third way into it, and the spironolactone um, usually aren't checking the labs unless there's some reason to have a metabolic derangement in the individual. Yeah, and I think what's really I, I want to point out about your answer is there's a rationale. So we look at who we're prescribing these drugs to, what their comorbidities are, what their history is, and if somebody is on an antihypertensive, a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor, an ARB, but they really need the spironolactone, you're gonna be monitoring them because it's appropriate. But for all those normal healthy people with no kidney problems, it's not adding a lot, so that's great. So here's another common situation. This is a young man who comes in, he's self-conscious at the gym, so he comes to see us about what looks like onychomycosis. So how many of you were told you have to prove it's onychomycosis before you can prescribe any of these? Yeah, I've been told that. Well, <laughs> prove it's a uh, tinea unguia, not just onychomycosis. So, tinea in the nail. So, I, I thought about this and I was thinking, you know, you look at a patient and, and you're looking at the rest of their skin, you don't see psoriasis, you don't see any other dermatosis that it could explain why this nail is thickened, it's yellow, it's broken, it's distal, it's lateral it's onychomycosis, right? So how good are we at clinically diagnosing onychomycosis? Because if I'm pretty good at it, what is a test gonna tell me? So how often do you think we're right when we say Jason has onychomycosis? What percentage of the time do you think? Pretty good. That's pretty average. Some people are better. What do you think the upper limit is? That's a, it's a high estimate, but 91%. So when you look at a nail and you are trained as a dermatologist, things that you can look for that will increase your accuracy are those things that I put here. But about 74 to 91% of the time, so basically nine out of 10 times, when you look at a person, you say, I think that is a fungal infection of the nail, you are right nine out of 10 times. 
What's also important is that we're fairly accurate. So when we look at somebody and we say that is probably not an infection in the nail, we're right 95% of the time. Now we're not perfect, but neither are the tests. So things get into our tests, like we were talking about tap water and just things from the environment that get into our cultures and our swabs and give us a false result. So we get false positives. It's most common with cultures, but definitely with other things. False negatives, where I clip the nail and those thin sections that the dermatopathologist looks at, they just don't see the fungus. So tests are not perfect either is the point. Now tests might make sense if somebody has an atypical appearance of something. If you've tried treatment and it's recalcitrant, because especially things like terbinafine work best for dermatophytic infections of the nail. And there's a cost to the test. So if I'm required to do it, but I'm pretty good, why am I spending that extra money is my thought. Now, a lot of this requirement for testing came from way back when terbinafine cost $500. So it made sense that if I was gonna be wrong one out of 10 times, I really don't want to be wrong. I wanna find the people who truly need a $500 medication. But how much does terbinafine cost now? 12 to $24 at your Target, Giant, Walmart, a number of different places oral, outside of insurance. Oh, oral regimen? Oral regimen. This is per month? Yeah. <laughs> so you can get terbinafine, sometimes wow. cheaper outside insurance, no insurance, just a prescription for very mm. little money. And this is the idea of what a clawback is, where you actually would pay more through insurance than you would out of pocket for a prescription medication. So we'll touch on that in a minute. So why then, if I'm going to be wrong one out of 10 times, it's not a big cost. It's 12 to $24, not a big deal. So I'm not sure that this requirement for testing is making a huge impact. But you could say, well, do we really want to be handing out terbinafine with its liver problems every one out of 10 times that you're wrong? Which I think is a really important question. So dealing with terbinafine, dilly, love that, uh, drug-induced liver injury due to medications. I want to show you a picture. So you're going to see this object fly by. Any idea what that might be? It's a meteor. Oh. So this was a gentleman from Norway who jumped out of a perfectly good airplane with a parachute on. So he was skydiving, wearing a body cam, and jumps out, happens to have this meteor like fly by him about six feet away. Not something that happens very often, right? I'm pretty sure when he was up in that airplane, he didn't stand at the door with the wind whipping by him, like hold it on, look out, look left, look right, no meteors, I'm ready to go. <laughs> because if you look out, you're not, the meteor is not there, it's not visible. So being clear now does not mean that you're gonna be protected later, right? Nobody goes skydiving and expects to have a meteor hit their parachute or hit them. Now, thankfully it didn't, he was fine. That's an incredibly rare event to have happen. And, you know, there's no pattern. Like you can't say, well, meteors most often hit, you know, skydivers in January, but not in June. So I'm gonna choose, you know, the time of the year or time of the day. There's no predictability to having a meteor fly by you when you're skydiving. And this analogy is essentially what drug-induced liver injury is in terbinafine. I feel like I was programmed to be afraid of terbinafine until I read the data. Drug-induced liver injury with terbinafine is like being hit by a meteor when you're skydiving. Because, number one, let's put this in perspective. Top 10 drugs that cause DILI, drug-induced liver injury, are not antifungals, they're antibiotics. We hand out a lot of those without thinking about the liver. Augmentin is actually one of the most common drugs to cause drug-induced liver injury. And that makes me think about all our patients with hydranitis superativa who receive a lot of antibiotics. Bactrim's another one. But if you do think about antifungals, it's I feel like the one that 
nobody programmed me to be afraid of is five times more common than terbinafine. So here's some of the rates. Augmentin, itraconazole, and terbinafine. And what's I think important is look at that denominator. It's per 100,000 people. Now, since I'm in DC, I looked up the population of Capitol Hill. Capitol Hill has about 30,000 people in it. So if we took all the people from Capitol Hill three times over, two people would have the side effect from terbinafine. So it's pretty rare, just like meteors falling out of the sky near skydivers. What we're actually more likely to find with our monitoring during treatment is an asymptomatic rise, which is not predictive of the drug-induced severe liver injury. About one out of 100 people will have a mild elevation in their LFT. Now, if you see an elevation that is three times the upper limit of normal, that's probably a sign that something's not quite going right, but it doesn't have to progress to drug-induced liver injury. So if you see a three times elevation, stop the drug, talk to your friendly hepatologist, but it doesn't have to be fulminant liver failure. So the take home point is, when you think about terbinafine, think about skydivers and meteors. So it comes on fast. That meteor flying by, the looking out of the plane to see if it's clear, doing a test every month or every six weeks, that test being normal doesn't make you feel better because there are many reports of somebody having checked LFTs, having them be normal, and then six days, 10 days, 14 days later, the person coming in with fulminant symptoms and signs of liver failure. So it's not helping us predict or find those patients because it's coming out of nowhere. It's unpredictable. So we can't say who's gonna get it, which skydivers are gonna have that meteor hit them. We don't know which patients are gonna get liver failure. And it's not, there's no time of year or a certain dose, but it is very symptomatic. So what we do suggest is to get a baseline test because if somebody has abnormalities from the start, this is somebody that you will follow for a good reason. They may be more likely to have drug-induced liver injury, whereas somebody with normal LFTs at the start is, again, that meteor two in 100,000. What you can do is tell them, while the lab tests are not going to help me find this incredibly rare side effect of terbinafine, I want you to help me know if you develop yellowness in your eyes, yellowness in your skin, if you just feel like you have the flu. People feel terrible. They feel itchy. They have edema. So counseling them on the symptoms is helpful, but that lab test is a false sense of security. It's an impact on our patients but it's not actually helping us find those patients as we continue on the terminophene. And very similarly to isotretinoin, some people even check CBCs when people are on terbinafine. This is pretty rare, but again, if people have a history of immunodeficiency, whether it's a liquid cancer, whether it's HIV, uh, whether they're immunosuppressed for another reason, those people may be more likely and deserve to have the CBC, but it's not all comers. So the take home point is have a reason for why we do things. And I think about that a little bit more consciously. Yeah. Well, Dr. Free, so my training, I was told to get CDC LFT baseline six weeks and when you finish. Yep. I don't do that anymore, but where did that come from? Like why did why was that passed down to the generation? That is such a great question. And I love like the oral traditions of the <laughs> practice of medicine. <laughs> because I feel like I do things because somebody older than me did it that way. <laughs> and I never said, well, why am I doing it that way until I finally got here? And this is the time where I'm trying to say, why am I doing what I'm doing? Who is it helping? Is it just making me feel comfortable or is it actually helping my patient? Um, and so at this point, I don't check labs most of the time. So baseline and usually not afterwards. So this is the last of the monitoring topic. Uh, so this is a patient with hydranitis who uh, I would be thinking about starting Humirapor or adalimumab. Um, now a lot of biologics are used for other conditions like psoriasis and we're used to ordering a lot of tuberculosis testing. So we're screening these people beforehand, but traditions of the practice of medicine, I get them every year. And one of the things to think about is which one am I getting? Because I ordered a lot of PPDs and the nurses would place them and then I would 
place a lot of second PPDs because we missed the window. Like that is a pain in the butt. Why are we having people come back in to read these PPDs? And it's so subjective. I've got my ruler down there. I'm like, oh, where does that end? I, oh, I don't know. So PPDs have a lot of problems. So interferon gamma releasing assays have been studied pretty frequently. And what's nice to know is that they certainly make sense who have been, uh, for people who have been vaccinated with the BCG vaccination because their PPDs will be positive. So you needed the interferon gamma releasing assay, which tests to see if your lymphocytes react against TB because you've been exposed before. It also makes sense for people who never got the BCG vaccination. And I think what's funny about the CDC comment here is that these tests are preferred for any person with a low rate of returning to have a tuberculin skin test read. I was like, who isn't likely to not come back in? So pretty much all of our patients we send down to the lab. Now one of the challenges with the interferon gamma releasing assays is that they're a little bit touchy on if they uh, stay warm too long. So you get a lot of borderline tests. So I think we just need to really work with our labs to make sure that these get sent, drawn, and stored the correct way. Otherwise, people are getting uh, second ones of those. So to Adam's point, this is the way that the package insert reads for many of the TNF inhibitors, to check a TB at baseline and periodically. What is periodically? Is that every three months, every six months, when I feel like it? I don't know. And so I just got used to the tradition of the people around me in residency ordering a TB test. They're like, you should do that once a year. Okay, I will, yeah. Um, but then I got a lot of normal PPDs and interferon gamma releasing assays. So some of the newer drugs that have come out that are not TNF inhibitors, this is what their package insert says. Baseline with active TB symptoms and after treatment discontinuation. Now this is fairly subtle, but it got me thinking. This kind of makes sense. You know, if somebody has symptoms, I should probably be checking them. Um, because is my test going to predict if they get tuberculosis the next year? It just says they weren't exposed in the past year. And how common is tuberculosis in the United States? Not super common. So I was kind of curious about how often this kind of came up. So this is not dermatologic patients, but using the same drugs. These are 3,300 patients who got a TNF inhibitor. There were two people who developed TB while they were on a TNF inhibitor. Two out of 3,300. Not very common. And actually, these two people had a history of TB already. They had been diagnosed with latent TB. And so this is not the person walking around in the US who's never been exposed before. There seems to be a population of people that might be more likely. Or there might be a reason or symptoms about when to check uh, these TB tests. But unfortunately, this is where I don't have the answer for you. There isn't a lot of data to show us really what the rates are, what the predictors are for those patients, but it really makes me wonder why I'm doing what I'm doing. Why am I checking them every year for people who keep walking in just fine, who aren't traveling abroad, who aren't coughing, why am I doing it? And so that's really where I think there's a lot of opportunity to move forward. Let's change the way that we order these tests because if people are low risk and they're not gonna get tuberculosis, why do we need to order the tests if they're asymptomatic and at low risk of exposure? So this is just a wrap up for this part. We talked a little bit about acne and the way that I've started to change some of my monitoring. It sounds like you are too. For onychomycosis, we're pretty good at diagnosing this and the cost to the patient is pretty low. Hopefully, I've made you think about terbinafine and maybe it's not the terrible, awful, dangerous drug that I was trained to think it was. And with biologics, hopefully in the next uh, year or two, we'll be given a little more information about who really needs TB testing at what frequency. Because I know that our patients, we have this annual visit, they come in, I'm like, you look great. Your skin's clear, how are you feeling? Great, good, remember to get your flu shot. And then we get their T-spot and that's it. Like they're doing great. So. What am I adding there? 
It's like a little annual have fun. Mm -hmm. All right. There was like a, an icebreaker I was going to do right here. Oh, here we go. All right. So this is Sebastian. Um, I wanted to transition into treatment. And uh, until I came to Penn State, I thought triple threat was something related to sports. Is it like you're a great defender and you make free throws or something? My husband knows about sports. I don't really know so much. Um, but at Penn State, the triple threat is related to acne. It's about giving them oral antibiotics, a topical retinoid, and some kind of BPO combination product. And you can see it's pretty significant acne. Sometimes people come in and they're just not quite ready for isotretinoin. So we say, all right, let's do this. Let's see where we get. But if you're still not doing very great, we're going to do isotretinoin next time. So we give them the triple threat. And it made me wonder <coughs> with those combination products, which one's better? You know, insurance often tells me which one I can get. Does that happen to you guys? They're like, no, you can't have. I'm trying not to use brand names because they're so much easier to say. Um, benzoyl peroxide with clindamycin or benzoyl peroxide with erythromycin. I was like, is one of them better? Should I be arguing with insurance about which one I want? And so this is a paper, it's a pretty old one, looking at the mean reduction in acne using these two drugs over about 10 weeks. And those lines are pretty <coughs> similar. So take home point is, no, I don't have to fight with insurance and drugs work pretty well. Will all things be equal with the value equation on top? the outcome I'm achieving, is there something that I can think about in regards to the cost and how much they cost? So clindamycin is the top two bullets, erythromycin is on the bottom. And if I was going to get a little extra or at least same benefit with lower cost, which one would you choose? The bottom one maybe, EPO with erythromycin. But that is still a lot of money for uh, a drug I think you still have to store in the refrigerator. I don't go to the refrigerator to put on my medication, so <laughs> I think that's a little bit of a barrier. What's kind of interesting about the paper that this uh, data comes from is there was a third arm, benzoyl peroxide alone. I didn't show you that arm. Here it is. So thinking about value for patients, we're going to get some amount of value. I'm, I'm going to pose this in a slightly suggestive way, that if we give everybody benzoyl peroxide, there's a baseline amount of improvement, a certain level of improvement. How much more improvement do those combination products get our patient? Not much. Two and a half pimples. <laughs> I practiced this talking beforehand and I was rounding up to three and the person I was practicing with they were like no two and a half you should say two and a half <laughs> so two and a half pimples and at what cost so we know that I can get benzoyl peroxide over the counter for about twenty dollars for fifty grams what is fifty grams of those combination products cost it's going to be an additional either one hundred and sixty to five hundred dollars for two and a half pimples same volumes of medicine same disease we're treating so this is now the way that i talk to my patients now that i know something about the data is i can say if we try this medicine i know it's over the counter it used to be prescription some formulations still are i can get you this much improvement if we decide to go with something that has two drugs in it you're going to get rid of a couple more pimples. It's going to be potentially more expensive. Help me understand what your thoughts are. I try to give them those options. This is the challenge. This is a typical aisle of any large pharmacy or store. And there's something called choice overload. I don't know if this ever happens to you when you go shopping. But as human beings, if we're given too many choices, and that's somewhere around more than 7 to 10, our brain just shuts down. It's like, cannot compute, and you just walk out of the aisle having bought nothing. So what we need to do is overcome this with our patients, because there is a study that my colleague did calling patients after they had a visit with us, a visit with us where we recommended benzoyl peroxide. What percent of people do you think bought a product? Just, just went to the store and bought something. What percent? Uh, be optimistic, it's a little higher. 66% went to the store and bought something. What percent of those people got benzoyl peroxide? 
Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it is very hard, given this enormous aisle, your brain like wanting to shut down, to turn each one around and look at the active ingredient, find those words. Benzoyl is just one of the weirdest spelled words, I think. It's just, you know, hard to do. Um, and so we need to really make this easier for patients. Um, I remember as a resident doing a project, we had to argue two sides of an ethical uh, argument, and it was about selling products in the office. And I remember being on the side where we should not do it. We got assigned. Um, and at the end, I convinced myself that selling products in the office was probably not the best thing because it was a conflict of interest or a conflict of duty um, to, as a physician, potentially. But having gotten the results of this study, it makes me wonder if it's very hard for my <coughs> patients to go out and just not be overwhelmed or to find the thing that I know from science is the best thing. What if I did just have it there on the counter and I had a policy that said, nobody is gonna market this stuff, people can ask about it if they want, we're gonna sell it at costs, but at least I know that they can leave the office with the thing that has the right ingredient in it. So I don't have an answer for that, but it's something that I've thought about. I haven't yet gone through all the administrative hurdles of actually selling anything in the office, but it's the time that it made me rethink something that I thought I'd figured out earlier in my life. And you could argue that combination products, maybe they do better, you know, maybe that study's wrong. Maybe they work really well. There's a good reason to use combination products because they improve adherence. So actually in other conditions, this is pretty well known, diabetes and hypertension, there are two diseases where it is really crucial to have people have their medicine. And they often require more than one medicine. So these are big studies showing that when you put two drugs together, there's about a 13% higher chance that people took their medicine regularly. So it improves adherence, meaning days with medicine, by about 13%. So they, there's one study looking at this with combination products for acne. And we did even better. So it's 22% better days with both medicines. Is that what we're interested in? Is that what our patients are interested in? Days with medicine. What are they interested in? If they don't have acne, right? So clinical improvement. What this study showed, there was no difference in the median improvement. So even though the group with a combination product had more days with medicine, both medicines, it was a small study. They did not find any clinical difference in those two groups uh, for their acne outcomes. And so this is just another point where I do tend to try and get people to get those benzoyl peroxide products over the counter because I know they can work. And especially when they say that marginal cost for that marginal improvement on that graph, remember those three lines, if they say that's not worth it to them, let's go with the BPO over the counter. So, my younger daughter has eczema, and this is about the time where I feel like we start to use a lot of cream. Actually, that's not true. We should have started about two months ago, but um, I'm a bad mom. So <laughs> we've only just started using a lot of cream this month. Um, and so we, we've thought about this, and we say, you know, we can keep buying these uh, you know, little buckets of cream. You know, what's the price per ounce? Or I could go to the warehouse store and buy a five gallon bucket that I just put in your bedroom. And you know, it's gonna be unsightly and it's a lot of money all at once, but it's like per ounce and per gram, a lot less expensive. There's a lot of things that I do that with, again, since I was raised by my mom and I love to save money. You know, we do it with cereal and ketchup because that's like a food group in our house. And we, so we do it with so many things in our day-to-day -day life, but do we ever think about it in healthcare with prescription medications. And so we did start to think about it with topical steroids. Does buying in bulk, meaning giving larger prescriptions up front, save people money as we prescribe? So thinking about the cost per gram. And so the idea here is if, if there was linear drug pricing, meaning the price per ounce of that cream was the same for a small jar as it was for a huge jar, that's linear. Whereas if I buy in bulk, the price per large day supplied or large volumes goes down. This is non-linear drug pricing. 
And this is essentially what happens for our patients all the time when they get a 90 day supply of pills. Again, we're pretty used to this concept, but have we thought about it with topical medications? So we did look at the cost to patients. This is copay costs. We also looked at just kind of general wholesale cost. And so this is flucinonide. If it was linear pricing, we could predict that the price per gram for 15 grams, which is about $16, would hold if we prescribed larger amounts. So if we could predict that a 60 gram tube would cost $64, it's not. It's actually $33. So this is non-linear pricing. So if we know that somebody is gonna need a larger amount and we prescribe the 60 gram tube, their cost per gram is gonna be lower. This is even more striking with trimcinolone. So if the price per gram for a 15 gram tube was 750, we'd expect that a one pound jar would cost $227. It doesn't, it costs 41. So if we know that people are gonna need a soak and a smear, if somebody is going to need medication for a decade, that's a really, that's an exaggeration, for a year, for six months, then we should maybe give them that jar up front. Now, arguably, we're pretty good at thinking about this. Sometimes our colleagues who are not dermatologists are a little less comfortable prescribing large amounts. And this is where I think reaching out when we do talks, when we talk to our colleagues outside of dermatology, helping them understand if somebody has a lot of skin involved, don't give them the 15 gram tubes. Give them the big jar, because they're gonna need it, and it's gonna save them money. So just an aspect of thinking about that. So I talked about co-pays. Again, just thinking about this for a minute. What does co-pay mean? I feel like to me it means I put in some money and my insurance company is putting in some money. But, Interestingly, that's not always how it works. So there was a study showing for a lot of very common drugs in medicine that when people are paying their copay, the drug company is not paying anything. That there is money that they're actually taking out of that exchange that's called a clawback. They're taking back money by absorbing it from the copay. And what's interesting is that there was something called the gag rule. The gag rule said that pharmacists could not tell patients if they were paying more with their copay. Now this legislation just changed back in October and it said now pharmacists can tell patients. What's important is one, this rule doesn't apply to Medicare patients until a year from now, January of 2020. So pharmacists cannot tell Medicare patients if they're overpaying through insurance. The other important thing is they are not forced to volunteer the information. So our patients must ask the pharmacist, what's the cost for my copay? What's the cost if I pay outside insurance? They can now tell them before it was illegal, but it's just patients have to know that they can ask that and really should ask that. What's the extra clawback or overpayment amount? This is for those most common medications in medicine. The lowest is about $2, sometimes it's pennies, but this study you know, said $2 is like the minimum we wanna look at. But it's sometimes higher than $20 per prescription that patients are handing over thinking, this is the best way that I should do this. But I was kind of curious, what would happen if we looked at topical medications? For a lot of things in general medicine, uh, JAMA, topical medicines are not things that come up, but they're in our wheelhouse, the things that we think about and our patients think about a lot. So we just did this study looking at the market scan database. This is a database that looks at privately insured people, the claims for medicines. So nothing that we prescribe, but they never filled. These are all prescriptions that were definitely filled. And it looks at the cost to the patient. We then compared it to the average price for um, pharmacy chains to see what the cost would be outside of the insurance. And what's important is this is an increasing trend. I'm gonna be really interested in seeing what happens now that the gag rule has been reversed and will be completely reversed a year from now. But over the last five years, the frequency of overpayment has been increasing for both generic, and generic is that orange line. 
So overpayments for generic medications is actually higher than branded medications. The amount is increasing. Over the last five years, the amount of money that's been clawed back due to overpayment in COVID <coughs> has increased and topped $120,000. Now, you could argue that's not really a big amount of money, but there are certain types of medications where that 20 bucks, that overpayment, that 120 bucks could be really helpful to each one of our patients. So what are some of those differences by drug class? Because we don't want patients necessarily having to go to the pharmacist and ask about every medicine and search every single one. If I can give them sort of targeted prescriptions where they're more likely to overpay, that's my goal. So. Here are those largest bars, the ones where the overpayment was the highest. Blue is branded, orange is still generic, but it's topical antifungals. These are all topical medicines. Topical antifungals, topical AK field therapies, <coughs> topical retinoids, and vitamin D analogs. So for these medications, I would probably say, if I'm prescribing one of these, please make sure you ask the pharmacist about what the cost is outside of your insurance. If you don't know how to look for prices outside of insurance, GoodRx is one. There's a million other apps and websites that people can use these days to look for the out-of-pocket drug cost. But I would target these first. This one is topical steroids. So it's a small little overpayment cost uh, for both branded and generic. It's less than $20. But for a person who's maybe pretty tight on funds and topical steroids are the most common thing that we prescribe, this is where just keeping it in the back of my mind as a possibility, I think is important as I um, counsel my patients. So wrapping up treatment, questioning what I thought I knew about combination treatments, how efficacious they were, and is it worth the cost? Ways to potentially save money. If you know somebody's gonna need a lot of medicine, prescribe a lot all at the beginning. Getting clawed. So are our patients paying more in their copay than they really need to pay for the medication? targeting those most common drug classes and letting them know that they can and should shop outside of insurance for some of their drugs. So wrapping up, value in everyday dermatology, thinking about trade-offs. We want to get people to a point. We need to get their input. What are you trying to achieve? Here are the tools we can do it with. Here's what they cost. And starting to think about those ways that I've been thrifting my whole life outside of medicine. How can I do it inside of medicine? <coughs> Knowing that the way that I was trained and practicing based just on tradition is not the way I should move forward. And I hope that as you move forward through the rest of your careers, you can question, I think very frankly, why am I doing what I'm doing? Is there better data? Do I have a good reason for what I'm doing right now? And that questioning your practice is just a normal way of staying a fantastic doctor. So I hope that you have questions. I would love to hear them. And before I wrap up, what are one or two things that you think you would change as you leave today? What do you think? Yell them out. I know you're awake now because you get to leave in just a minute. <laughs> ordering potassium. Yeah. Mono yeah, potassium. Yeah. Good. So you might do it a little less. Yeah. You can, can work your way towards being comfortable. See, they had recent days and I thought I would do less. Perfect. Good. They don't have so much. Young, healthy women, yeah. not on yes. drugs no, yes. that would increase. Yep, so it's just looking at that med list. Yeah? size of the tube that we prescribe for topical steroids because we use that for virtually everything and instead of having a patient pay so much for just a 15 gram when you know that they're probably going to use it again just mm -hmm. get a bigger get a tub if you can mm -hmm. I wish so many more steroids came in big yeah tubs it's just a little interesting yeah, 60 grams is often as big as, mm -hmm. as I see other than the one pound jar. I think at that point, I think we educate the emergency rooms because they are the greatest offenders of getting the 15 gram or two and a half gram tubes of penicillin. It's always penicillin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, there is, I didn't put it on here because it's, I guess, a slight conflict of interest. We developed an app for non-dermatologists called the Corticocrine Calculator, and the uh, non-dermatologist is free on the uh, Apple Store and for Android. You tap on the body where they have the affected surface area, and it does a body surface calculation to suggest unit sizes and how much the person needs because we're so used to doing that. It's just embedded in our brains as part of that calculation, but it's not something that non-dermatologists think about all the time. And it also includes uh, variations in strength for folds of the body and suggesting lower potency for that. So if you have um, people you think might benefit from using that, please suggest it. I think one, one area that might be, it'd be interesting to know is, um, is litigation regarding these issues, uh, looking at, you know, how many of, uh, if you don't order that test, you know, has that ever been a, a source of litigation? I, I practice, um, I've practiced 25 years in Florida, where we have more attorneys than doctors. And um, we have, a, you know, um, everything is for the people with that guy. And um, so if you don't order those tests, what is your medical legal risk? It'd be interesting to know you know, what kind of litigation has had, has there ever been a litigate ever regarding um, turbine feet, you know, in the past 25 years? And it may never have been a, a case. Right. And which I, would be very, you know, reassuring to people who, who if you didn't run that extra test. Right. And, and not being a lawyer, I think that there's a lot go that goes into having uh, a litigation uh, started versus so few are completed um, and right. you can have things that are not always medically based that are the source of the litigation and keeping in mind Tough there is still that two out of a hundred thousand just that based on the data we have right now we can't always predict who those two are going to be so I think that if we make sure we counsel our patients honestly and fairly and we just tell them I, I can't totally protect you from this here's what we can do. Do you have to treat it? No. Is this an infection that's going to get in your blood? No. And I think a lot of people are reassured just knowing this is not something that is a threat to my life. That relationship yeah. is, is so important. Right. And part of the standard also is what would any other reasonable person in the physician's position do? And I think it's just really important. This data is out there. It's been out there for decades about terminophy. Um, I think it's just the challenge of tradition sort of breaking that mindset that I know I had. Yeah. We're gonna actually get some more questions. Um, actually, Scott has one, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna channel my inner Norton and ask um, <laughs> questions. All uh, right. in his... So, um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so um, what, in terms of labs, and I, I, I might open this, do you still check pregnancy tests every month? So, we do. We do a urine pregnancy test because I don't, I'm not ordering blood work every month, so I don't need to send them down to the lab to get a blood HCG. So our uh, clinic has the cups, they come in, they pee every month, we do a dipstick, and it's that quick. So we still do. But it's more out of the eye pledge requirement than uh, a medical monitoring requirement. And for men, do you have them come back more spaced out every three months and like prescribe without them coming back? So we're piloting a telederm isotretinoin follow-up. So we'll have those men come back via a online visit and they fill out a survey. I think there's a lot of really novel ways that people can try and be creative. I think it's a little hard that the system sort of puts some artificial constraints on it. All right, let's open it up. Questions? All at once? Um, so uh, I, I saw the thing about um, how you know, um, if you get transomer in a uh, jar versus like a two gram tube. I remember I had one attending who told me though, like um, sometimes we like to give smaller amounts to prevent people from overusing or using it improperly. Um, and that's why, you know, not to give the big jar every time. I mean, what do you think about that? I think that's totally reasonable. <coughs> I'm kind of curious, how often do you guys see people who have used steroids the wrong way and had a problem? I, I've personally heard many times people have 
use these slides to practice on as your voice director because they don't understand mm -hmm. any feel that voice directors as much, but it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. cool. <laughs> yeah, I heard you. It's okay. Um, so yes, I'm going to push you a little on that. How often did they have a problem from it? Yeah, so I think that uh, there's more, I think, providers, and again, this, I don't know why it seems like we're constantly programmed to be afraid of things. Like, be afraid of this, be afraid of that, be afraid of this other thing. Make sure you tell them not to do this and not to do the other thing without really knowing how often it happens. Um, I've had the same thing happen. Yeah, my patients come in, they're like, I'm using that moisturizer you told them. I'm like, uh, yeah, that was trying to sit alone, but you look great. So I think um, I think that we're afraid more than it really happens, essentially. So I agree to your point, it does happen. I think it's un an uncommon day. If there is a, a real concern that somebody's gonna be rubbing something like a super potent, or super potent topical steroid in a place where they may get striae, and that's what I'm afraid of. Atrophy is reversible, striae not then I'm probably going to choose a lower volume. And I think that's totally appropriate. And adrenal sufficiency is probably as common as that, that parachute getting hit by the meter. Right. right. Yes. yes. I'm going to think about that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're pretty good here. Um, thank you for a very interesting talk. I feel like this is almost like a new field, like dermatopragmatism. Or what oh happens. my gosh, you're a genius. <laughs> <laughs> My question had to do with the concept of uh, the combo treatments for acne versus you know what what your benefit is versus the cost. Like, are you talking to patients about this? If they do have the option of getting the combo medications, are you giving them that option and explaining the difference in the cost? Is it um, guided by insurance, and are there certain patients that are therefore like getting suboptimal care because they don't have commercial insurance and they're underinsured? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think your last point about are people without insurance being undertreated, I think we can say that they're not because in that graph, while the separation of BPO was lower and it was statistically significant at 0.04, that clinical difference of two and a half pimples. Arguably, it's not. I don't think that's suboptimal care unless their pimple's this big. So I think that people are doing just fine. And I think it's really nice to know that we can get people good care without requiring insurance. I do just have the conversation with people. I try to be really mindful of my own biases, that I love to save money, but that's not everybody. Some people, they, they want that extra two and a half pimple relief. And they're going to try and get it through their insurance. If we're successful, great. Um, but I just try and, and frame it that way for them. And that's monotherapy. You're likely to use you know, retinoid as well, and you don't have that data. Yeah, so you don't I, know I, with I the retinoid where they have that would affect you. Maybe the same problem. Well, I would argue that adapted over the counter is going to be one of the greatest innovations yeah. in terms of access. And it's nothing new, but the fact that you know, patients can get it you know, it's yeah. from Medicaid to AmeriHealth, and then you have the insurance that they want you to try five forms of BPO before they will push you to the ER, like you did retinoid. Um, I think that's made a very big difference in terms of their care. Yeah, and I was anticipating having more trouble telling people, like, I really like this medicine called Adapalene. It's now over the counter. They seem pretty amenable. I thought I was going to get a little bit of a concern. You know, I'm here at the doctor's office. Why are you telling me to get these two over the counter medicines? I don't get a lot of pushback. Again, we haven't done the same study, which is. How often do we tell people to get the over-the-counter adapalene and what percent actually get the right stuff? Because it's important to remember <coughs> that the different brand has the adapalene and it also has a moisturizer, like two packages right next to each other on the shelf. So you just have to warn people, look for the one that costs more because it's going to have the active ingredient. You don't get the lotion, which is the lower price. And that's just so. Yeah. So obviously the cost of healthcare is you know increasing exponentially. And so think, you know thinking about this is something that I think we should talk about that we should be thinking about in our practice and that we should and what we're starting to do. But one thing I struggle with day to day is I don't know how much any of this costs. And like obviously you pointed to a couple of things for us, but in terms of lab tests, in terms of medications, like do you have a good resource? And I know obviously with insurance it varies a little bit to say that you know on that side, but what would you recommend day to day how to try and yeah. that in our own practice? 
I, I think that is an incredible point and one that I haven't figured out. Um, with our EMR, we get little clues. There's often a little tag next to the prescription that's either green or red or white. And it's supposed to be correct for that person's insurance. Sometimes it's wrong and I get calls after the fact. So uh, there was just a study out of uh, Penn and it was in the last year or so, Jules uh, Lipoff um, did some uh, interviews with patients, you know, saying, what, what if we, you know, give you the a prescription, you get there, what kind of solution do you want? And it's not call me if it's too expensive. Um, they, they want you to give them sort of the second uh, potential option. So if I write uh, tretinoin, for example, and if it's too expensive, I just tell them, you know, if anything's ever too pricey, just tell the pharmacy person, I don't want to pick that up. Because I think we need to give them that freedom and that power. Because I've had people just pick up whatever I prescribe, not knowing it cost them $300 or something absurd. So I think telling them that they have that power to decline it. The second option would be buy this over-the-counter adapalene. But I don't always have a backup, and I don't always know what the challenge is going to be each time. So I think one of the ways that we could do our jobs better is having accurate information in the EMR for each insurance that our patient has. We know that it makes a difference. So there's lots of studies showing that if we put the price next to something in the EMR, it changes our reaction. It changes how many labs we order, it changes what prescriptions we prescribe. So having that information is actually incredibly valuable. Well, thank you so much, that was wonderful. Yeah.